Good morning. Thanks for uh, coming today. I just want to talk to you a little bit about our work on integrated vector management. And uh, as a part of that, our study, that, our CAP study that we did, which was about the knowledge, attitudes, and practices related to dengue. I have to push the button on this thing. Okay, great. So as uh, you heard from Jeffrey a little bit already about dengue, um, but just wanted to give you a quick background, uh, since a lot of our work was focused on dengue, is um, that dengue is a vector-borne viral infection, and it infects about 50 to 100 million people per year, which is uh, likely an underestimate. And we have about uh, 17,533 confirmed cases from Cambodia last year, 2013. Um, an accurate, rapid on onset of illness comes with a, bun a wide spectrum of, uh, of clinical presentations and including fever and headaches and muscle and joint pain and rash. Currently, we don't have any drugs or vaccines available uh, to us right now to leaving the focus on prevention. So effective and sustainable prevention programs will likely need to include more than just uh, malaria or dengue, but include, uh, encompass all the vector-borne diseases. Which is why we were looking at uh, integrated vector management approach. And as a part of our uh, work, we basically the main objective was to assess and strengthen the ability of the community and these health systems to better prevent the spread of the disease and find ways to improve recognition of symptoms and identification and be able to respond to those, uh, especially dengue. So we had three main parts of our project that we did. The first was a, a CAP study uh, on the prevention of dengue. And the second was a behavior change communication using positive deviance for, uh, principles. And the last was a surveillance assessment uh, and outbreak response. So today I just want to talk to you first about the first two. And, and uh, the first, first thing I want to talk to you about is the CAP study. So. This study was uh, happened between December 2013 and uh, January 2014, and we did it in six provinces, which were selected based on our risk assessment by CNM. And the study used a two-stage random sample design uh, using probability proportionate to size. 30 villages were selected out of a total of 5,563. And uh, within each village, we chose 26 households uh, for a total of 780 households in our study. Um, so you can see here's a picture of uh, one of the uh, data collectors interviewing uh, one family here. So here's some of our results. You can see that uh, as, a, as a part of the knowledge section, we asked several questions in each of these three categories uh, about sim symptoms, prevention of breeding, and prevention of biting. Uh, this table looks at those who had high knowledge uh, by different demographics. And for this purpose, we considered people having high knowledge if they correctly answered two or more questions about, uh, about the symptoms or three or more questions about mosquito breeding or biting. So you can see here, interestingly, uh, that um, that those who had higher education had significantly higher knowledge about prevention of breeding and biting. And uh, in this case, we considered higher education to be those who had completed sixth grade. We we'll also see that, interestingly, oftentimes we think of people who are wealthier having more knowledge uh, than on average. But in this case, we, uh, we, we found that those who have more wealth did not have significantly more knowledge in any of the three categories. And in this case, wealth was assigned through a principal component analysis, which included several socioeconomic variables. And this suggests that perhaps education has had more impact on knowledge rather than just wealth. Um, here we see, um, oh, sorry. This graph shows uh, the effect of dengue knowledge on prevention practices. So what this graph suggests is that those who had high levels of knowledge were significantly more likely to have a higher level of prevention practices. Here we use the same three knowledge categories as described previously. 
We also assessed about 17 different uh, prevention practices, designating a high level of prevention practices as nine or more, or slightly more than 50%. And the results were also significant at other practice levels. As further evidence to the link between the high levels of knowledge and high levels of prevention practices, we can see the results from this multivariate logistic regression analysis. Here, demographic variables were put into the model, and we still find that all three prevent knowledge categories correlated significantly with higher numbers of prevention practices. Um, there's also evidence from this study uh, done by Conrad et al. from uh, UC, da UC Davis and also uh, AFRIMS in Bangkok. Uh, and they, um, they looked at, in addition to taking knowledge, attitudes, and practice, they also took samples of mosquitoes. And, uh, and what they found is that they concluded that there is a direct link between knowledge on dengue prevention and container prevention practices, but not only the link between knowledge and practice, but also the link between practice and the number of mosquitoes you have in your house. You can see here that the more protected containers they had in their household, the lower the likelihood of having a infection. So we can see that um, there's this, a big impact between the, effect, the impact of, ha of uh, knowledge on your prevention activities and the prevention activities on how many mosquitoes you have in your house. So we want to encourage people to uh, have to learn more and to have more education on um, on, in, on dengue and malaria and other uh, vectors. So we have a uh, as we have a new pilot uh, program going on in Bantamince, uh, which uses a positive positive deviance approach. So we select people from the community who are already doing good behaviors to teach those behaviors to other community members and. Uh, our behavior change communication specialist is going to talk a little bit more about this tomorrow so you can learn about that um, more. But in this case, in Bantamince, we focused on dengue and we did a baseline and end line survey and we did some focus groups and in depth interviews and selected those volunteers that were already doing the good behaviors. And then we did a tra training, as you can see here, and, month and monthly meetings. And then we had a seminar here where you can see where we had a competition where people drew uh, pictures and sang songs about dengue and we had um, leaders from the community like monks and others who gave speeches about dengue and, uh, and, and tried to raise uh, awareness and help educate people. So in conclusion, we can see that, there's a big, that there was a correlation between high levels of knowledge and the number of prevention practices used in the Cambodian house and that reinforces the need for continued dissemination of dengue prevention messaging. And we have a need to develop more compelling and more practical uh, vector-borne disease BCC materials. And we need to find ways to get those materials to people, more innovative ways to, more and, and more effective ways to get those out. So going forward, we're hoping that uh, uh, as an organization that we can continue to support programs to improve neglected tropical disease uh, through monitoring and evaluation activities, surveillance assessments and outbreak response, and looking more at behavior change communication. And I just wanted to say thanks to our donors, UK Aid, and to our partner, CNM, and to John Beckham, who helped a lot with the analysis, and to others who, and our team who helped gather the data.